How about this weather today? I'll take it, boy. Yeah. Well, uh, appreciate you guys coming out. As always, we'll see you a couple times at least next week, and the uh, off-season program will wrap up. So it's been uh, really, really good work. Obviously, you guys probably saw we had, uh, I think, over 20 Vikings legends here today. Just, you know, one of the cool things we can now do again that hasn't been able to happen for two years, you know, trying to get these guys around our team. You know, it's, I, I told them today, every time we can have that connection between the past and present, with the history of this organization, I think that's a real positive. Um, try to make it happen as much as we can. You'll see them out here a ton in training camp and, and hopefully at a lot of our, uh, a lot of our games. But, um, you know, another OTA in the books, a lot of really, really good work, did some situational work um, and continuing to build. And it's, uh, we're in a good spot right now. But with that, I'll open it up to you guys. Well, how, how far has the team come just as far as offensively in the adapting to the verbiage? I, I mean, it just, it seems like there's a lot to learn here. Yeah. I mean, how far down the path would you say these guys are? They're doing a great job with it, and there's there's always going to be you know teachable moments throughout the throughout the course of these practices because it's not like we just go in the meeting room and say okay today the only stuff we're doing is this. I think it's really important you challenge these guys to be able to stack days. You know physically it's one thing preparing them for what will be to, ahead competing in training camp, but mentally as well. I just told them when I talked to the team, you know, let's not allow the things we've done, you know, stacking these days to need to be things we've got to cover again and talk about again. Let's let's make it fundamental things that we're cleaning up now as we start to click up in the speed of things and the com competition of things. Let's not make it mental errors. Let's not make it things that we can control, but just by preparing coaches being on top of things and, and, and us doing a great job communicating from the top down. And then, in my opinion, it's, it's been what's been really excited about our quarterbacks, especially Kirk. I mean, they control a lot and they're running the show, whether it's tempo, whether it's, you know, the situation situational stuff that we're doing um, and, and these guys are thriving they're doing a great job and continuing to build but that's a good question and I like where we're at. Kevin we saw Amir Smith-Marset looks like he suffered an injury yep. is he looking at a pretty lengthy um, road to recovery? No really just uh, where he's at his spring's pretty much over just based upon the timing of things um, but we expect him to make a full recovery be ready to roll for training camp uh, it's just really a precautionary thing making sure we handled it now uh, so he could get off to a good start have a good you know, four or five weeks in the summer to kind of prep for training camp and be ready to roll. Playing practice or when, when did, did yep. he get hurt? Yep. Yeah. A, a little, a few days ago, you guys weren't out here that day. What? Ankle. Can you tell us? Uh, lower, lower leg, lower leg. I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to throw out exactly what it is, but uh, I just play one on TV, <laughs> but uh, no lower leg. He'll be fine for training camp. And, and he it was really good because, uh, you know, he's it's, it's a, a true test for a young player when you do suffer an injury, a setback, not letting it be, affect you in the meeting room. He's still dialed in front and center every day. The decision too. to sign Albert Wilson unrelated to the injury sustained by Mir smith Marset. Yeah, and, and KJ had a little something come up too, but nothing serious. We may get him uh, back going again next week. Just once again, this time of year, you know, as much as we've stressed these guys to really learn and kind of absorb the system, the last thing we want to do is, is stress them when we really don't have to. So Tyler and, and Uriah are doing a great job with all of our guys. I mean, any time you have a 90-man roster and you're out playing football in any capacity, there's going to be ultimately some things that come up. But, uh, but no, the, uh, that group and that receiver group, just they come out and work every day. And then every once in a while, you have to take care of those guys a little bit and make sure when the time's right that they're fresh. Uh, Adam Albert obviously is, is just adding a veteran player with a skill set that we like. Uh, we like our receiver group right now. Obviously, with you know Justin and Adam, uh, they're doing a really really nice job, kind of absorbing things, understanding they're not just going to be in one spot. They're not going to be just in one location. They're playing all over the place, uh, doing a lot of different jobs in our offense. And then you know when we do have those three receivers on the field, we're going to have competition and really use the skill sets of all the guys that end up being able to help us. Turn kind of an area where Albert might be able to help, or are you just keeping him at receiver for now? Yeah, right now, as far as punt return goes, that is such an important role. Um, you know, obviously, KJ, Amir, uh, those guys have a skill set to do it. I think Albert does as well. I think some of our guys on defense do uh, as well. So that'll be one thing, uh, especially when you start looking at competition and, and mainly the, those actives on game day. If you can provide that, the return skill, or really any other phase of special teams, uh, you guarantee yourself a jersey. You guarantee yourself a chance to contribute on offense and defense because the rules, the way they are, we don't get to take all 53 guys to the game. Kevin, uh, last
last week uh, Kirk was talking about uh, using flashcards to, to learn uh, the verbiage. And it made me wonder, like, why, and this is more general, not specific to Vikings, but why do teams change the terminology so frequently or every time you ch they change teams? And what's what would be the downside of just kind of picking up where the team was the year before? Well, I, I, I do know for a fact that you got to give the defensive coaches some credit. And nowadays with the TV copies and there's players mic'd up, I mean, uh, verbiage ends up being on the tape, and, and the TV copies have become a valuable thing around the league, uh, not just to hear you know, the analysts predict plays and things like that, but to actually hear what you're putting on tape, cadences, uh, different things that we do at the line of scrimmage. We just want to be aware, you know, uh, you know, as you teach things, you want to make things learnable, you want to make things digestible for the guys, so then if you do need to make a, ch a change or a tweak, it kind of revolves around a system, and it's not just random things being thrown against the wall. So I think it's one thing to go to a place, hey, this is a similar play, but to change the name, you might be two or three years from now and have to explain to a new player the why, uh, which we like to do around here. And uh, it gets hard when you don't really know the original <laughs> intent of why something was called. But there's, there could be some things as we go here uh, that, that we keep as, you know, as is from either last year or previous years with Kirk and, and maybe some other guys. So uh, it's never an absolute. It's kind of case by case, making sure that, A, you know, we can coach it. Is there a reason behind why we're doing things that we're doing? And then what's the next step? We're not only just coaching off of June 1st. We're worrying about, you know, when we've run this play or that play, what will be the, the next step off of that? So how do you come up with a why? Like, what's the process for figuring out? If you how could to see the, the word banks of things we have as coaches, sometimes the best way to do it, uh, I learned this uh, obviously with some really smart guys in LA. Sometimes the best way to do it is let them come up with it. Hey, here's the play, here's the intent. You know, go to work, come up with the best thing you got because you'll be surprised how easily they learn it when it came from their original thought and, and, and coming together. Stuff from their lives or was it? Anything and everything, no yeah. doubt. Kevin, what were you studying when you were learning? Trying to pick up you know what I, the, I I did I do have to write things down you know I do like to the flashcard thing is not that's not the, something that uh, I, I'd be opposed to nowadays you got guys with iPods iPads you know they're they're uh, they want to see it on the video honestly the best thing sometimes is them for to, for them to see themselves doing something especially at those skill positions hey it's exactly like this but here's the difference here's the detail here's the change up and then you can coach off of something because. These guys have some experience now, and they've had some some success and experience, you know, playing at a high level. So let's take the things that they've done and build upon them, and try not to make everything as new as we possibly can. But at the same time, it's got to be foundational learning, in my opinion. Otherwise, you're just kind of randomly throwing things around. Kevin wanted to ask you about, you know, Wes Phillips. How? Yeah. When did you first get to know him? What's kind of your relationship with him, and why'd you bring him in as offensive coordinator? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, first got to know him actually the same year. Uh, I was able to coach uh, Kirk in uh, in Washington. Wes was the tight ends coach there, and um, I just from the time I met him, uh, just immediately connected with him from a standpoint of, you know, how he watches tape, how he is able to game plan, how he connects with players. I mean, he's got an unbelievable way about him in front of the room, uh, teaching football, teaching things uh, to connect in a way with the guys where they. You know, it gets hard sometimes standing up in front of the group day after day for an hour, two hours, whatever it is, trying to get them to be engaged. Uh, very few guys in the league I've been around better than that than Wes Phillips. Um, obviously, with his his uh, you know his family history with his his dad and grandpa, great great line of coaches that he's learned from some great leadership, and you see it every day he comes to work. You know, he works incredibly hard. The guys on the offensive staff I know really enjoy being around him and. Shoot, I just, uh, you know, the, 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 top, the clock's ticking until he gets great opportunities around this league, and I'm just happy he was uh, able to come with me and be a part of it here. Yeah, we didn't see Zedarius Smith out there at all yep. today. What, what kept him off the field Just today? very, very late, just kind of a little, uh, you know, uh, cautionary thing uh, with him. Uh, he should be back ready to roll on Friday. We saw Adam Thielen make a pretty crazy yeah. one-handed catch back there. I mean, the, the, all the touchdowns he scored over the last few years, what's it like? as a play caller, knowing you have somebody who's just really an elite red zone weapon like that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's that's something that doesn't always, you know, go into the evaluation early on, and then it just starts to show up. And, and obviously what he's done in the red zone uh, over the course of his whole career speaks for itself. 
He's got a tremendous feel and knack for just understanding as that field shrinks, you know, where that open grass is and how can I be a friendly target to the quarterback. And that, that play you're talking about is just an example of Kirk kind of feeling his body language in the route. Do we coach it to throw it in that area? Absolutely not. He's just really throwing at him open with some trust. I think that's the big word, the trust in the red zone to kind of play through the eyes of the quarterback and be available and be that friendly target. And he's, I mean, uh, he's done it throughout this whole spring. And then you go back and just watch uh, a lot of the things he's been able to do. There's a lot of times where, you know, he's scoring touchdowns and, and it might not be exactly how you drew it up. And whenever you can get that to happen, either those off schedule plays to any one of our guys, or maybe even the on schedule kind of opportunity throws like that one, um, you know, that, that end up being big time chances for our offense. Is that a real thing where, I mean, Kirk and, and Adam have been playing together for four years that they oh, have, yeah. like, that trust that he's going to be able to make that play? Absolutely. And there's, I mean, obviously in an OTA, there's no, as I tell some of the corners sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll get awful sticky, awful jumpy on routes, but there's not 70,000 people and a whole bunch more people watching at home to see them, you know, get run by on a double move or something. It's the same in, in kind of the opposite way for quarterbacks and these receivers. They're trying things out. We're teaching a system, but then they got to take it, and, and that's that player ownership. You know, you guys have heard me say from my very first day here, where they can take something and then apply their experience together, apply their ability to activate, you know, different ways of winning within the scheme, uh, both at the quarterback position, all, all you know, the other ten guys around the quarterback offensively, and and that's what we're ultimately hunting. Ed's doing the same thing on the other side. Here's the scheme. Here's the intent. Here's what we have to make sure gets done, and then go take it and and, and become playmakers process for you as a coach of figuring out where players have that freedom to take the ownership of it is there are there kind of certain situations yeah. where you tell them it's okay here it's not okay here or how do you go about that you said the word i mean situationally comes up a lot in my mind where hey we need the detail exact right here it might be a a clock situation late in the game where you got to make sure everybody knows exactly the intent of the play called to know that it might be different than the other 10 times we called this play. Well, this might be a field position thing. This might be a situation where we need 10 yards for a field goal and then the clock's going to determine whether we clock that or take a timeout or maybe get a second playoff, whatever it is. But, but the, the nuances of making it your own at that point become less important in my mind and the more important thing is the detail of doing it exact so that precision can show up when we need it the most. Uh, the, uh, the ability to perform in the red zone, some elements of that are pretty obvious to identify like size, yep. vertical ability, and the one that you talked about with Adam Thielen, the ability to generate space, is that one a little bit more difficult when you're trying to project receivers into your system or into the NFL to see if they can replicate the red zone success? Absolutely. It's, it's, there's just so much that goes into it. Leverage, you know, what, what's the defensive intent? What are they trying to take away? Because really, there's a 12th defender out there when, you, when you've got that back line and the field does condense. That's really when they don't have to defend vertical grass, every little blade of grass matters because if, if it's an inside or an outside leverage player, you know, the technique and fundamentals are going to be such that they've got to be detailed because otherwise one guy gets that timing thrown off within a concept of five eligibles. Uh, you might be progressing to somebody that's not where they're supposed to be. Then you can take sacks in the red zone, which are critically uh, negative plays and, and, and maybe even worse, turning the football over. So ultimately, you get down there, it's great to drive the football between the 20s and, and activate all of the tools in our offense. But like every other offense in this league and really every other defense in this league, uh, you know, those are winning plays. Those are, you know, four point swings, seven point swings uh, that you got to be able to take advantage of. And, and that's where you can coach those things from the jump. We don't install a red zone play without talking about a red zone philosophy, you know, how we want to play down there. And then the plays and the X's and O's come in. But it's a great question because it just leads you to, you know, X's and O's are great, but how you play, how you handle the football, the decision making of the quarterback, the off schedule opportunities that may present themselves. There is. I mean, I could go on and on about just the detail that it takes to be a really, really good red zone offense and defense. Um, and that's why we work it. And, and you guys will see us work it a ton uh, before leading up to our first game. Last one for Kevin. Kevin, how much have you been able to evaluate what you have in the offensive line where on the one hand you're with them on the field for the first time and on the other hand they're not really in full pads doing the full thing? Yeah, and I think uh, we'd love to you know, go 11 on 11 full speed and be full padded. And I was telling some of our legends that uh, were asking me, uh, you know, what's going on out here? I said the rules are a little different now than, than when you guys played. They were probably either doing two-a-days at that point or <laughs> whatever they were doing. But we're trying to take care of them. You know, a, a lot of that is uh, part of having almost 90 guys here every single day, having your whole football team here. 
Um, you know, they got to, this is a voluntary time. So I'm very well aware of what that means, but we've got to figure out ways to keep them engaged, keep preparing them for when real football starts and that competitive uh, aspect of trying to make our team comes into play. And then ultimately preparing uh, for what's going to be, uh, you know, preparing these guys' bodies for a 17 game schedule and hopefully more from there. So uh, in, in regards to the offensive line, I just think uh, you can get a lot out of just that first step, that first significant touch, that first ability to see, you know, did that guy exactly do his job? Maybe he's working in combination with somebody else. Maybe it's an adjustment. Maybe it's just that reactionary thing where you can say the game makes sense to that guy. Uh, and that shows up a lot when you just watch the tape, no matter how fast you're going in those settings. But Chris Cooper, uh, Justin Riscotti are doing a great job with those guys, especially having, uh, you know, themselves as coaches not been in this system before. Been really impressed with those guys' ability to teach what we're doing here. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, it was. Uh, I didn't get a chance to spend a ton of time with them earlier, but but just catching up with them. I'm going to head over there and do that right now. Uh, any chance we can get? The last two years were hard on everybody, but having them around your team, uh, having them around, you know, young players, old players, but understanding we got a special, special history in this organization. Um, I cannot stress that enough, and, and, and great people within this community that still live locally here. If they don't, we're going to ask them to come back and just be around our football team, just like we can't wait to have fans out here uh, at training camp again and, and, and can't wait to see that in, in, in the not-too-distant future. It's going to be a good time. Thanks, guys.